What is the universe? Who are you? Are we alone? Many are the theories that provide plausible answers to these questions, but will we ever find a reliable one for all of them? More and more proven analogies suggest that there was a contact. A contact made here, on Earth. For two and a half million years, our historical ancestors lived in caves. But then suddenly, everything changed. Human beings began to build huge monuments all over the planet. But how? And why? Were there perhaps other non-earthly beings who helped to show them the way? Our ancestors considered these beings precious. They worshipped them as if they were gods. In fact, in many of the cultures that have inhabited the earth, the centre of the human mind has often been associated with the centre of the earth, and the centre of the earth as the centre of the universe. This centre is depicted in the shape of an egg, the cosmic egg, and is present in some cultures as the third eye. Were the ancient aliens involved in this too? So these entities aren't a threat to us, but they want to help us. Can ufologists confirm this theory? Is there enough evidence that leads us to believe that UFOs want to save our planet? More and more of these sightings occurred in military areas when the first atomic tom was detonated in 1945. The arrival of nuclear weapons seems to have attracted the attention of these extraterrestrials. But why? Are they afraid that we will destroy what they helped us to build? But if in fact they are our allies, how can all of the abductions be explained? Why are there more and more phenomena that lead us back to the existence of UFOs? Then, the mysterious case of the Bermuda Triangle. What's there? Official stories of disappearances of all kinds, right in that area. What is so different about that point of the ocean? compared to all the others. Given the small amount of the ocean we have explored, we are probably missing out on something incredible. Fortunately, many researchers and experts have decided not to just limit themselves to studying just the skies, but have decided to broaden their research to then reach the great discovery, the UZOs, unidentified submerged objects, the so-called UFOs, of the sea. Are we perhaps surrounded? For now, the Earth is the only planet containing that precious component, water. Is what is here really ours, or is it thanks to someone or something else that we have all of this? Have we been visited in the distant past? by technologically advanced civilizations? Perhaps right at the dawn of our evolution. Astronauts, who came to us in antiquity through space travel. Landing on the surface of our planet, coming from the stars that fill our skies. Our ancestors were surprised seeing spaceships that emitted light and noise descending upon them and recognizing the differences to human form, they were undoubtedly mistaken for divinities. It was the 20th of July, 1969. Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins were the first human beings to walk on the moon. 
And this is also why our first thought is, if our civilization, which is at a basic level of knowledge, was able to explore a small satellite in space, then is it also possible that a civilization or more civilizations may have visited our planet in the past? In many sacred and ancient texts of the world, the story is always the same. The gods descended from heaven on flaming chariots or aircraft that emitted light. If we take, as an example, an ancient text such as the Bible in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet meticulously reports an encounter with celestial beings who came down to earth aboard incredible flying machines. Ezekiel speaks precisely of contact with technologically advanced beings. He talks about creatures with four heads that emit divine, shining light. He says they appear as human-like beings. The first is seated on a flying throne where underneath it wings can be seen that when they beat emit a sound similar to that of a storm, exactly the same description of a space shuttle taking off or a departing space missile. Ezekiel speaks of flying devices and describes them as wheels within other wheels. And here, technology is translated into the supernatural. A fundamental step towards understanding the truth, a truth that comes from far, far away. In some caves in Italy, there are drawings depicting astronauts wearing helmets. Also in America, in Utah, we have petroglyphs of strange creatures with antennae on their heads wearing helmets. On the other side of the world, in Australia, we have the exact same drawings of these beings wearing a helmet and with a halo around their head. The question we must ask ourselves is, what did our ancestors see so that they felt compelled to portray it on cave walls. In Guatemala City, there is a sculpture that is eerily reminiscent of a modern day astronaut. He is wearing a helmet, there is a kind of mouthpiece, and on his chest there are controls and a breathing device. How did they manage to create such a thing more than 1500 years ago? Thousands of tomb artifacts resembling modern-day airplanes have been found in Colombia. They depict wings, a tapering head and an upward tail fin that does not appear in nature, but it does exist in modern aerodynamics. Did our ancient ancestors see something like this flying across the sky? Another interesting artefact can be seen in a museum in Israel. It portrays a headless spaceman sitting inside a spaceship. You can see his hands and some tubes going towards a device. He is wearing a type of spacesuit and his legs are bent. He seems very aerodynamic. There is something cosmic about him. these people witnessed something and with simple tools they left evidence of it. Many of these ancient civilizations were distant in time and space and were not in communication with each other. Yet they possess similar accounts, depictions of the very same things. Maybe because everyone had had similar, sinister experiences? Did they all already know that we are part of a cosmic hierarchy of beings? 
There is legible evidence regarding these extraterrestrial visits, such as that that can be found in ancient texts. And there is also visible evidence, such as the numerous rock paintings and stone writings that can be found all over the world. And this is where pictures are worth a thousand words. All these ancient illustrations or statues portray figures dressed in strange ways, wearing unusual headdresses. But are they really alien astronauts? Visitors from other worlds who landed on the Earth millions of years ago? The most significant illustration for proponents of ancient alien theories can be found in Mexico. The Mayan archaeological site of Palenque had been abandoned for centuries when it was discovered by Spanish scholars. Here were found great pyramids, a secret tomb in the depths of the earth and a very important sarcophagus. The sarcophagus of the ruler of Palenque. We are in the 7th century and we are talking about King Pakal, a two and a half meter tall, mysterious Mayan leader who apparently died there. They built this pyramid around his tomb and the Maya worshipped him as if he were some kind of deity. Ancient astronaut theorists interpret the engraving found on his grave as a man sitting in a capsule with a mask on his nose. With his upper hand he manipulates some controls and with his lower hand he is switching some kind of device on. His heel is placed on a pedal and a flame can be seen outside the capsule. Pakal appears not to have been the only alien who once walked upon our Earth. The Maya had a very advanced calendar and mathematical system. Why were the Maya so obsessed with the stars? Theirs was one of the most advanced ancient cultures. Yet, the Maya disappeared around the year 500 and we know nothing of their end. As if they had vanished into thin air. By now there is multiple proof of an alien existence. The pyramids are connected to the gods, gods who once came down to earth. Without a little interplanetary help, how could the early Egyptians have learned to stack the nearly two and a half million blocks of limestone to create the pyramids? How could prehistoric man move the immense boulders of the Stone Age? How could they make the stones fit together so tightly and precisely? Putting this puzzle of the ancient world together is a very complex process, but there are gigantic blocks of stones, huge articulated blocks of granite that in some cases can weigh a thousand tons, that can be found in Peru and Bolivia, in Mexico and in ancient Egypt. One has to ask the question, how and why did these ancient peoples drag blocks to stack them on top of each other to create these giant structures? The best known and most mysterious megalithic structure in all the world is the Great Pyramid of Giza. the oldest and largest of the three pyramids in Egypt. It is believed that this engineering miracle was built over a period of 22 years. But for ancient alien theorists, these accounts do not add up. It is impossible that the Great Pyramid was built in just 20 years, because if that were the case, it means that they would have had to cut, transport and place a stone 
every nine seconds. Modern engineers say that even today they couldn't perform such a feat in such a short time. How did they build internal spaces so perfect and so clean, surrounded by granite and marble, inside pyramids and tombs? One thing is clear. Somebody, somehow, helped our ancient civilizations. In Egypt, there are ancient traditions that say that the Great Pyramid was built by a pharaoh named Saurit. The name Saurit refers to the person known in the Jewish community as Enoch. Enoch is an Old Testament prophet. The books of Enoch are apocryphal texts. So is there a connection between the figure of Enoch and these extraterrestrials? He clearly states that he met them. In the apocryphal scriptures, it is written that Enoch gives the order to erect a building that cannot be destroyed for thousands of years. The ancient Egyptian texts clearly state that the pyramids were built by humans, but with the assistance of the guardians of the sky, that is, of the gods. It can be assumed that the pyramids were built by human hands, but with the help of extraterrestrial technology. In 1877, the writer and theologian Joseph Seiss demonstrates that the Great Pyramid stands at the intersection of the longest line of latitude and the longest line of longitude, at the exact centre of the entire landmass of the world. In addition, all of its four sides align precisely with the four points of the compass, even though the compass was invented thousands of years later. Are all these just coincidences? Has the truth always been in plain view? In many of the cultures that have inhabited our planet, the center of the human mind has often been associated with the center of the earth, and the center of the earth as the center of the universe. In a close similitude that represents the meaning of creation itself. This center is often depicted in the shape of an egg, the cosmic egg and is identified within some cultures as the third eye. The inner eye, that of the unconscious. There are many different cultures that have adopted this theory. Hindus within their culture have the third eye. For Buddhists, the third eye is on the forehead of Buddha himself. There are similar representations in Mesoamerica and in many other cultures. The third eye symbolizes, for many of these cultures, its ability to contact and communicate with the higher spiritual realms, and therefore communicate with the gods, with the higher beings. But if we think about prayer itself within the Catholic religion, isn't prayer a way to try to communicate with the spiritual realms, the kingdoms of heaven? Throughout the history of ancient cultures, all these populations, through prayer or meditation, were said to be in contact with the gods, different gods. Tesla himself stated that there is a terrestrial field that connects all things.
Princeton University has demonstrated the existence of the new sphere of global consciousness, the collective human mind. We are all connected to every single object in the universe. When we talk about the third eye, we are talking about higher enlightenment, a possibility or capacity developed over the years through transcendental meditation processes. Being able to get in touch with the spiritual realms of existence. It is a connection with the great unknown, with the force of the universe. With all of us. The cosmic egg leads back to the third eye for the ancients. It is the archetype of the creation of the universe. This image is from the Book of the Dead. The image depicts a southern cosmic egg on the left and a northern cosmic egg on the right, with two women pouring the waters of creation into the egg. Even the ancient Egyptians have depictions of the cosmic egg. They depict a life after death, so it is a symbol that is connected to the spiritual realms. How can it be possible to find this symbol in numerous cultures if all of these cultures were spread all over the world? How if these cultures never made contact with each other? Why has this meaning and that same representation transcended the ages and placed itself at the center of this very meaning? This is Piero della Francesca, a 1472 work depicting the cosmic egg, symbolizing life after death. Here we have the cosmic egg depicted in the microcosm within an esoteric representation. Here we have a medieval depiction of a phoenix rising from the cosmic egg. Historians believe that there are also great affinities with the pine cone held by the Anunnaki, the gods of the Sumerian pantheon, because it resembles a cosmic egg. Could this be connected too? Is everything connected? According to the theory, in which an ancient extraterrestrial visit to the planet is suspected, it is believed that the third eye is a metaphor, created to identify a part of our brain that is fundamental for understanding what it means to be human. That is, the thalamus, which has the shape of two eggs. Another simple coincidence The thalamus is an even structure with an ovoid shape that includes several nerve nuclei divided into four distinct parts and it has different functions. Its main one is the functioning of all sensory systems. Experts in neurology call it a processing and transmission station. The Eye of Horus symbolizes good health and prosperity. But it was also known as the Eye of Providence, the all-seeing Eye of the Gods. The really absurd thing is that if you look at what the thalamus and all the nervous structures surrounding it are like, it looks exactly like the representation of the Eye of Horus. The meanings attributed to the power of the gods or to the connection with them 
can be traced back to the specific functions of the thalamus within our brains. This same meaning is often attributed to the pineal gland. This gland, in 130 AD, was described as the seat of the spirit, the seat of the soul. The most interesting aspect of this gland is the fact that it produces DMT, or dimethyltryptamine, a neurotransmitter, also called the molecule of God, which has particular functions related to the connection of the body and the spirit. It is no surprise that this substance is still used in South America by shamans who say they are in contact with the gods. Is this pine cone also linked to the Anunnaki and the cosmic egg of creation? Young stated that our psyche is constituted in harmony with the structure of the universe. And what happens in the macrocosm equally happens in the infinitesimal and more subjective recesses of the soul. Apparently, the ancients knew these things much better than we do, and all the shamanic practices of coming into contact with the alien gods of antiquity could still be put into practice if only we reached an adequate level of consciousness. On the basis of the new sphere, is it possible to connect to the construct of the universe? Are advanced civilizations in the cosmos already doing this? Is the technological advancement of these civilizations focused on the development of personal cognitive abilities? Why do different populations who have never come into contact with each other have as a symbol the third eye? The third eye that represents the inner self, the ability that human beings have to communicate with the gods. something changed. Perhaps the awareness of the human being. Maybe a feeling such as arrogance took over. How come ancient civilizations welcomed alien beings and decided to venerate them and then found millions of ways to cover everything up? What exactly are they hiding? Who is behind all of this? One thing is certain. These advanced beings have never stopped observing us and visiting our planet. The UFO mystery continues to be one of the most intriguing puzzles that has always fascinated mankind. What are those brightly lit objects darting across the sky? Are they perhaps piloted by beings from other planets? Is it always them? Or have they evolved over the centuries, as we eventually did? And why should travellers come here? Is the Earth actually that special? Many researchers believe that the evolution of mankind itself can answer this question. One theory even claims that extraterrestrials developed an interest in us the day we detonated our first atomic bomb. Did visitors from other worlds fear that we could become a threat to the universe? that with our rockets 
we could have destroyed inhabited worlds. During the two nuclear explosions in 1945, the first flying saucers were officially sighted. In 1947, the pilot Ken Arnold was flying over Washington State. And when he landed, he claimed to have seen nine silver discs following him. And according to his estimates, they were flying at approximately 2,600 kilometers per hour. He described their movement as that of a saucer skipping along the surface of water and the reporters were so enthusiastic that one of them coined the phrase flying saucers. But were the flying objects Arnold saw really the first UFOs? During the Second World War, luminous objects were sighted following aerial bombardments as they made their way to their target in Germany. Are there any objects sighted in our skies in the past that suggest what the real mission of the alien visitors is? In November 1896, in California, a ghost ship suddenly appeared over Sacramento. It projected a huge beam of light in front and behind it and had some strange equipment like thrusters or wings. The object travelled around the rest of the country during April 1897 and there are numerous descriptions of it. Something similar happens in Minnesota. The object is described as a flying ham with headlights. Then there is another sighting in Texas described as a rugby ball with a swallow tail and bat wings. There are several thousand reports of sightings made between 1896 and 1897 all across the planet. There are drawings that are more than 400 years old and they are documents that change many opinions. They were found in the 16th century. Whoever made these drawings had certainly seen something. They are evidence of sightings even in that century. The difference being that they were considered as divine signs. In August 1566, in Basel, Switzerland, huge black globes floated in the sky. And earlier, in 1561, similar objects were sighted in Nuremberg. If we turn to the 16th and 17th centuries, we enter the golden age of sightings that we generally call UFOs. John Calvin said that miracles occurred every day. In a depiction of the 1600s, you can see some strange objects in the sky. The Roman historian Livio tells of a flying object that crosses the sky. In Istanbul, there is a strange map made by a 16th century Turkish cartographer. The Piri Reis map was drawn up in 1513, 21 years after the discovery of America. In it, it is to be noted that Antarctica is a continent, but Antarctica was only discovered in the 19th century. And there are mountains that were not discovered until the 20th century. How is that possible? Only somebody who had seen the planet from above, from space, could have made a map depicting the Earth in this way. And it is also strange that the Piri Reis map was created 
at a time when Western civilization was heading towards great expansion. Were the aliens really starting to take an interest in the course of human evolution? Could their involvement have been vast enough to give us such important advances? El Castillo is a pyramid in Mexico, where, twice a year, on both the spring and autumn equinoxes, a ray of sunshine falls perpendicularly across its steps, so as to create a mysterious shadow. The image of a giant snake crawling along the base of the pyramid attracts the eye. The snake is the representation of Kukulkan, the Mayan god who is said to have created all life forms on Earth. It was he who ordered the building of the pyramid in this way. But why would the serpent god order a structure like this to be built? And why was it built with such precautions as to ensure that the image of the snake appears as if by magic, twice a year. This pyramid works just like a calendar. It counts exactly 365 days. For a people who did not have a calendar, this was the signal of the beginning of the seasons, therefore of the sowing and the harvest, and it meant life or death. If these monuments were indeed a gift from the gods, then those superior beings were deeply connected to local civilizations. They wanted them to live and thrive. But why around 600 AD did the Mayans abandon their cities and crops and head north? It wasn't for war, it wasn't for epidemics or famine. They set out as if someone had ordered them to. Is it possible they emigrated to teach others their knowledge? That they achieved these goals without any outside help? Assuming that extraterrestrials have been visiting the Earth for thousands of years, wouldn't they have left evidence of their existence? Anything other than the stories, the drawings of strange objects in the sky? Many scholars think that this kind of evidence can be found in the Nazca Plain in southern Peru. These traces are probably 2,000 years old, but their resemblance to a modern-day airport is quite striking. The tracks found in Nazca are described as landing strips. So, are they remnants of space traffic? They are figures visible only from above. They probably needed them to indicate their route. If this is true, what will interplanetary travellers have brought here? Or what will they have taken away? More and more interesting theories about UFOs are constantly being revealed. Let's say that beings light years away from us have never really managed to visit us. But maybe inhabitants of some nearby world have. But from which of the neighbouring worlds? Is it possible that it is another planet we are unaware of? At one time, people believed that intelligent life forms could exist on nearby planets. In fact, people associated UFOs with Mars or Venus. But today, 
we know that conditions existing on the other planets in our solar system make the existence of life unlikely. Zechariah Sitchin has devoted years of his life studying the theory that the oldest visitors on Earth came from a planet in our solar system. He believes that the answer lies in the Sumerians, whose origins are uncertain. The first information concerning them dates back to the 3rd millennium BC. We can find many answers to questions about extraterrestrials, and we can witness them in the ancient records of the Sumerians. Their civilization originated in the territory we know today as Iraq, some 6,000 years ago, and provided the basis for all the great cultures that followed. From the Babylonian to the Syrian culture, Sitchin states it all originated with the Sumerians. Writing and mathematics, the wheel, the oven, brick making, multi story buildings, the monarchy, codes, laws, astronomy, and much, much more. Many cultures have had to struggle over centuries to evolve. But the Sumerian civilization suddenly appeared, as if it had been transported there. The Sumerians were aware of detailed notions about the solar system thousands of years before modern astronomy was born. How is this possible? The knowledge that the Sumerians had of astronomy is incredible. They knew all the planets that we know today. They described and even depicted them in their exact positions and dimensions. Copernicus was the first astronomer to prove that all the planets in our solar system revolve around the Sun. This happened in 1543, but the Sumerians claimed the same thing over 5,000 years earlier. Another thing that is even more incredible, they described Uranus and Neptune as blue-green twins. We were able to observe these planets closely only in 1986, thanks to the Voyager space mission. This space mission described the two planets as blue-green twins. Exactly as the Sumerians had described them. Is all this just a coincidence? Is it just fantasy? The Sumerian text explicitly says that all their advanced knowledge came from the Anunnaki. a word which literally means those who came to earth from heaven. But where did these visitors come from? Did the Sumerians leave any clues? The ancient Sumerian writings describe a planet that revolves around the sun in an oblique orbit with respect to the others, and that makes a complete orbit every 3,600 of our years. They called this planet Nibiru, and it would seem that the Anunnaki came from this world. This planet is also called Planet X, and by continuing this theory, it may once have come so close to the Earth that the Anunnaki could reach it with special aircraft. If there were a planet like the one described, wouldn't it have passed close to the Earth over and over again? 
Some historical studies highlight various periods during which humanity seems to have made sudden progress. The first period dates back to about 3,600 years ago. The hypothesis that the Anunnaki took advantage of their proximity to Earth on various occasions and that each time they helped us to progress is very plausible. Are we all part of a cosmic science experiment? Why should aliens be so willing and eager to help human progress? Theories specify that it is likely that thousands of years ago these mysterious space travelers wished our race to survive. For the same reason, we wish our children to survive. Perhaps it was these beings who seeded the Earth with their own life forms. We could be their children. This theory could also be supported by the biblical account of the creation of man. The sixth chapter of Genesis narrates that the descendants took the daughters of man for wives, and then from this union children were born, who over the years became the men of antiquity. Are they referring to aliens by any chance? To the Anunnaki? Therefore men from another planet mated with human women and created offspring? We know that only recently, the key that allows us to read our genetic structure, the helical structure of our DNA, was discovered. But if we go back in time, we can find the same image in a Sumerian document from 5,000 years ago. It shows the process by which the Anunnaki jumped up the evolutionary ladder and created Homo sapiens. We have, partially, the same genetic constitution created in their image and likeness. This would explain why visitors from the skies resemble humans in ancient depictions. Have we then discovered ourselves? Does the modern theory on the existence of UFOs somehow justify doubts about the mystery of creation? Are there all-powerful beings responsible for everything we don't understand? In some ways, they are the equivalent of Zeus and Hercules in Greek and Roman mythology. Thus, in a certain sense, they represent the last chapter of the great story of human mythology. When aliens and mythology are mentioned, another of the most striking theories is that of the legend of Oannes. He emerged from the Eritrean Sea said his name was Oannes and that he was an animal, but gifted with reasoning skills. He had two heads, a human head and a fish head. Together with two human feet and a fish tail. The ancient Babylonian text continues by reciting that Oannes had absolutely no need to feed and that he spent all his time talking to men, teaching them science and the arts. It was in fact from Oannes that men learned writing, learned to understand signs and planned the construction of a temple. These teachings, together with the principles of geometry, gave a strong boost to evolution. 
they became the cornerstones of all cultures. The most recent information we have on Oannes tells us that when the sun went down, he dived into the sea and stayed there all night. It also tells us that after him, other similar beings visited the earth. Who were they? Who is Oannes? Better perhaps to say, who are the Oannes? According to the German researcher Ulrich Dopaka, the description of the body covered with fish scales would actually represent a spacesuit. So, is Oannes an extraterrestrial? If this hypothesis turns out to be correct, it could explain some oddities regarding Oannes. His having appeared in Babylon was in fact the first of ten other Oannes. They appeared not only in the Eritrean Sea, but also in the Persian Gulf and in the Red Sea. Oannes had landed from a glowing egg that had fallen into the sea. It was said that he came from the star Canopus, and because of his relationship with the waters, he was associated with the god Eridu, the lord of the waves. To broaden the scenario even further, it must be remembered that in ancient times, the fish god was known in almost all cultures also as the amphibian god. However, there is also another link from a linguistic point of view. In fact, reading the apocryphal gospel, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, he is acclaimed with the cry, Oannes, who comes from heaven. Later referred to as Hosanna. Was this just a spelling mistake? There are other possible connections. For example, the fact that the symbol of the early Christians was actually a fish that derives from the Greek word ictus, which in turn derives from Veshika Piscis, or the cosmic egg. Many scriptures always return to the same point. Is it all just a coincidence? Most scholars and most people who believe in the existence of a higher entity are, however, increasingly focused on observing and studying the skies, forgetting that space is not the only unexplored dimension there is another one. The sea, which is much closer to us. These phenomena that apparently have always been among us are now catalogued as USOs, the UFOs of the sea. The acronym was created precisely to catalogue unidentified submerged objects, or those that in the UFO field are sightings of mysterious objects under the surface of the sea. These are sightings not attributable to recognised objects, and even if the number of sightings are fewer than those relating to UFOs, it is a topic that deserves more truth. Most of the reports deal with objects that move under the surface of the sea with large dimensions, objects that produce no noise and have no apparent wave motion. Opinions on this subject are mixed. Often these are natural phenomena or military vehicles, but many cases now show the opposite. The United States began to show some interest in USOs as early as the 1960s. 
Later, on the 29th of August 1964, photographs were circulated showing a spherical object about 2,000 kilometers off the coast of Chile. Reports soon also arrived from Europe. In Italy, in 1978, in the stretch of sea between Bellaria and Cesenatico, a huge fireball rose from the depths and darted towards the sky. In 1994, the US Navy revealed a mysterious pulsing sound in a stretch of sea in the Pacific Ocean. The sound came from the seabed, and as the expert stated, it was not something biological, but mechanical. There was immediate talk of unidentified submarine bases. Facts relating to the famous Bermuda Triangle were even associated with underwater alien bases. In Canada, in 1967, in a small fishing village, which is called Shag, and which even remains off of marine maps, they faced a particular phenomenon. Everything began with the sighting of strange orange lights in the sky. It was claimed that the flashing lights headed out to sea and started floating on the water about half a mile off the coast. Everyone initially thought that it was a plane crash and took care to alert the Canadian police. Meanwhile, the lights were stationed on an unknown object about 60 feet in length. The first men arrived and they spoke of a yellow light that moved slowly upon the surface of the water, leaving a yellowish trail. No boats and no aircraft were missing from the roll call that evening. The following day, an official communique was issued. Something from the sky had hit the water. An object of unknown origin. The incident was quickly closed, with no comments from the official authorities. But why? Yet the American UFO Research Center conducted in-depth research on the case, noting deliberately unspoken details. The object traveled at a speed of 25 nautical miles in an area of sea close to a survey base. The object was picked up by sonar and the signal was sent to some nearby ships. After a few days, the authorities made an anonymous recovery attempt, even if no one ever specified what there was to be recovered. In December 1977, the crew of the fishing boat noticed a donut-shaped object that slowly emerged from the water, between 300 and 500 meters long. When it took off, it remained in stationary orbit almost above the boat, putting all its installation systems out of use. Evidence. Chilling testimony. Years afterwards. More and more people see things. Fewer and fewer people are silent. So if we have come to the conclusion that we have never been alone, now our eyes will no longer have to scan only the skies, but also pay attention to the seas and its infinite secrets. So, there are several theories that revolve around UFOs. Are they actually our creators? Have we, human beings, succeeded in progress with the help of somebody else? 
What has changed over time to lead us to hide the truth about our true existence? The theories may differ, but one thing is certain. We are not alone. We were not alone. And we will never be alone.